This grid is an 18x21 playable D&D map. Or at least, it will be. And today I'm printing a huge collection of awesome D&D terrain to bring it to life. All in full multicolour without a single drop of paint. Something only made possible by an awesome new printer. Those of you who watched my video exploring multicolour 3D printing some time ago might remember me mentioning my excitement for the future of multicolour FDM printers, and how I thought I might use that technology specifically for printing terrain. Because as much as I love the idea of having sprawling three-dimensional maps for D&D, I've found that painting terrain is not how I want to spend my hobby time. And the previous generation of multicolour FDM printers just took so long to print and wasted so much filament that big terrain projects like today's just weren't viable. Enter the Snapmaker U1, an innovative FDM printer that promises purgeless multicolour printing with up to four colours using a tool changer system. Until now that kind of capability had been largely out of reach for most home users, either due to the price or the DIY nature of the few machines that could do anything similar. So pair the U1's more affordable price tag with the quality of life features of current generation printers and you have something that I'm pretty excited about. And people seem to agree. With a 20 million dollar kickstarter behind it, this machine comes with a lot of expectations. And today I want to see if it lives up to the hype. This printer was sent to me by the team over at Snapmaker, so you should absolutely take what I say with a grain of salt. With that said, this is not a review. This is a stress test through an actual project, and my honest first impressions of whether this printer actually fits how I want to use it. I won't be diving into specs, but I will be talking about my experience with the U1, both good and bad. And after putting over 250 print hours on this machine already, I do have a bit of both to cover. But more on the U1 shortly, let's take a look at what we're printing. Dungeon Blocks is my go-to for D&D terrain. Without the need for clips or magnets, these blocks just drop into place to create some truly epic maps. I've covered the system on the channel before, but have only been able to go so big with the scope of those projects, simply because it just took so long. Not just to print, but also to paint. But with the U1 now ready to go, we only need to assign colours once for each block, and then we can print as many as we like. Now don't get me wrong, this can take some time, and it will. But taking 20 minutes to assign colours to these three trees, and then being able to print as many as I want, is way better than spending an entire afternoon priming, painting and dry brushing a batch of 50 printed pieces. So after spending a week or so hunting down all of the colours of filament I wanted, all PLA, I took the time to input all my colours into the slicer and got to painting. With our tools, filament and files chosen, let's get to printing the first section of our map where a group of adventurers have been tasked with locating some missing townsfolk. Continuing along the worn, dirty highway. The well-travelled road veers off to a merchant's shortcut. A path between the towns that runs along the riverbed by the nearby cliffs. The grass here is patchy and the trees are overgrown. It's here that you spot it. A broken cart and an abandoned campsite. Something happened here, but what? This small portion of the map contains blocks that I printed both at the very start and near the very end of the project, so it's a great opportunity to talk about some of my experiences with the printer itself. Overall I had a very positive experience with the Snapmaker U1. I was able to load up all of my various types of PLA from all sorts of brands, and they all behaved as I had come to expect them to from using them on other printers. The calibration was super simple when I set the printer up, and throughout this whole process I never needed to re-align the nozzles. Speaking of which, I'm very happy with the fact that there doesn't seem to be any noticeable offset whatsoever between each of the tool heads. 
and on top of that I only had to re-level the bed once or twice throughout this whole project. Overall the print quality is exceptional, and the printer is great when it's running smooth, but I did run into a couple of hiccups as well. I had a couple of prints where during a toolhead swap it didn't attach the next one properly. Luckily each time the printer noticed this and prompted me to reseat the head, and I was able to resume those prints. However, each time this happened it caused a subtle but noticeable layer shift for the rest of that print. Not enough for me to reprint these parts, but depending on what you're printing that could be really annoying. This only happened on 3 out of the total 35 prints I ran for this project, so it doesn't happen often, but it sucked when it did. And 2 of these 3 hiccups were within a couple of minutes of me changing the print speed on the printer, so take that as you will. Another annoying hiccup I ran into was after pausing one of my prints, when it came time to resume it the build plate forgot to raise back up to the level of the nozzle. I paused probably about 10 prints throughout this project and this only happened once, but that one time was enough to really suck. I'm hoping that some of these small hiccups are fixable with firmware updates, because aside from these few small errors this printer was pushing out some incredible looking prints. Cause I mean how cool is this? Fully coloured and ready to hit the table is awesome. As the party begins their investigation of the campsite, the ranger hears a rock fall into the water and catches a glance of something moving at the top of the cliffs. A spear hits the grass beside the barbarian and the party turn their attention to the hills, covered in ancient ruins of some long forgotten castle, it's the perfect place for an ambush. Walking out from behind the ancient stones and clusters of trees, a group of goblins cackle as they force the party to action. Snapmaker have chosen Orca Slicer as their slicer foundation. Yes this comes as a repackaged fork called Snapmaker Orca Slicer, which really only adds native wireless control of the U1. So yes it's a bit of a pain that I need yet another slicer, but good that they aren't trying to reinvent things that Orca Slicer already does well. And of course if you're used to Orca you'll feel right at home. Snapmaker Orca is still in beta, and you can often feel that. For most of my prints I had to re-slice a plate a half dozen times before it actually worked, due to it throwing up a few untrue g-code errors or poor prime tower generation, but I did always manage to get a plate to slice in the end. But it does seem that Snapmaker are actively developing the slicer, so we'll have to wait and see whether some of those pain points get ironed out in future updates. Admittedly the colour painting in any version of Orca Slicer can be a bit tedious, especially when you're working with complex models like these. Getting into hard to reach gaps to try and connect a line so you can fill an area is sometimes a struggle, but even on the worst pieces I am trading at most 20 minutes of assigning colours for potentially infinite copies of that block, which is totally worth it for me. If anyone does know of a better software or method for assigning colours please do let me know down in the comments, but for now if you're looking to undertake a similar project here's a few of my tips and tricks. One. Outline objects wherever possible and then use the bucket to fill them in. If you have two colours bordering a third, you can still do this by just using two colours to form your outline. You really just need to separate blocks of colour. 2. Always use the sphere brush for creating your outlines. The circle is not three dimensional, so it only sees what you see, so it will miss any back facing parts of the model you're trying to paint. 3. For natural looking colour variation, such as on these rocks, I use the fill bucket with an angle of 9 to 12 percent, or for the flat faces on these dungeon tiles 3 percent, filling in large flat areas and leaving small flecks of another colour on the edges and in recesses. 4. Use the height range fill whenever it makes sense. Sometimes this works best if you rotate the object as well. For walls and bricks like this, laying them flat can allow you to paint recesses super easily.
with all the goblins either slain or unconscious, awaiting a chance to question their captives, the party sit down for a night's rest. Looking out over the hills at the tree line beyond the townsfolk's abandoned campsite, the rogue spots a faint glow in the distance. A ghostly face appears from the forest ruins and locks eyes. Could this be the last visage of the townspeople they were sent to find? And there we have it, 324 tiles of playable space on this huge wilderness D&D map. All printed in full multicolor PLA, ready to hit the table for an awesome games night. And all without the need for a single drop of paint. But our adventuring party's story isn't over just yet, and there are a few more blocks I need to print. The party rush to the tree line in pursuit of the ghoul, but as they draw steel their blades pass through an illusion, set to scare any who pass by. Their goblin captive wakes from unconsciousness and pleads for his life, giving up the information the party needed. The townsfolk were not killed by goblins, nor turned into wandering undead, but rather the nearby cliffs hide sprawling caves that lead to a secret chamber, where a group of cultists require ritual sacrifices. The townsfolk they were sent to save have been captured. The party once more springs into action, and before long find the lair. With a hard-fought battle, after saving the townsfolk, they bring the cultists to their knees. But rather than slay them, they choose to take them back to town to face punishment for their actions. This last small section of the map is from Dungeon Block's most recent release, The Fortress of Malakar which is currently in its final few days of its launch campaign over on my mini factory. The team did kindly send me these blocks to have a play with, and as soon as I saw them I knew I had to include them here today. The Fortress of Malakar includes not only this dungeon block's terrain, but also miniatures by rescale, and a full 5e adventure for you to run with it all. So if you're looking to start your own collection of dungeon block's terrain, this is a great campaign to jump on board for. And I'll be sure to leave some links down below for that in case you're interested. So there it is, over 250 hours of printing on the Snapmaker U1, a huge map ready to hit the game table, and all in full multicolor PLA. This is what I want from multicolor FDM, and I'm super excited that the hardware is finally ready to pull it off. Of course a machine like this has a ton of uses, but in our hobby specifically, if painting terrain is always something that you've skipped, multicolor printing like this, it's a game changer. I'll leave a link to the Snapmaker U1 down below, and those are affiliate links. So if you were considering picking up a U1, doing it through that link will kick a small amount of the sale back to the channel to help support what I'm doing, at no extra cost to you. Drop a comment down below letting me know what you would be excited to print on a U1, or let me know what kind of D&D map you would love to see me print next. Like if you liked, subscribe to stay up to date with my FDM printing and tabletop projects, but most importantly, thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a good one.